Thank you, Anna. You could have left off the part about how long I have been here. I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, when Reverend Wilkin was talking about uh, stupid earlier, I thought he was going to bring up my friend Zeb. Some of you know my friend Zeb, and Zeb was asked to present one time at a conference like this. And Zeb went up to the organizer and he said, well, I'm not exactly sure why you asked me to do this. I'm, I'm certainly not the brightest person. I'm certainly not the most knowledgeable in this subject area. Why did you really ask me to speak here? And the conference organizer said, this way, the other presenters are going to look really good. And that's why I'm here, too. What I want to share with you this evening is how to present the message of creation in more of a positive sense. I've entitled this Positive Creation Evidences. Anytime you're going to debate a subject, there are certainly positives and negatives involved here. And if we spent more time, we could see that really any evidence could be spun either in a positive sense or a negative sense. But I hear often people complaining, especially about folks who subscribe to creation. You don't have anything positive to say about your idea or your model. All you do is tear down the other side. And I would agree sometimes. So how can we present this topic in a positive sense? When it comes to origins, and I know you're interested in it, and that's what this conference is all about, we know it could be somewhat divisive. As I'm sure, as with many of you, this is the credo that I begin with. As Reverend Wilkins said, we'll look at God's word for guidance in this idea of natural knowledge also. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And one of the nice things about being a scientist and being alive in the world is we do have a guide, and that's God's word. In addition, for Lutherans, for especially Lutherans who may be associated with the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, as Concordia University is, we have a fairly clear doctrinal position. If you're not familiar with it, this is the 1932 version of it. You see a little bit on the handout there. <laughs> We teach that God has created heaven and earth and that in the matter and in the uh, space of time recorded in the Holy Scriptures, especially Genesis 1 and 2, <clears throat> namely by his almighty creative word and in six days. We reject every doctrine which denies or limits the work of creation as taught in Scripture. Like, if you're like me, that's probably good. But what about when we interact with other people in the world? What about for the honest skeptic? Now, I don't want to get into a debate with Dr. Richard Dawkins. I don't believe he's honest about his skepticism. Nor is Dr. Michael Shermer, the head of the skeptics organization. I don't believe he's honest about his skepticism. But we're going to run into people who are honestly asking questions which, by the way, is a great technique all the time, right? So how do we answer the honest skeptic? I think the way to do that is to provide positive evidences for the creation model. I do believe that the scientific evidence overwhelmingly supports creation. That does not mean there is no scientific evidence to support evolution. There is. Some of you may know I do teach a course here in cosmogony. We spend a third of the class talking about <clears throat> origins from an evolutionary perspective the way an evolutionary scientist would do it. There is evidence. I think it's important to hear. We spend the next third of the class presenting origins from a creationary perspective the way a creationary scientist would do it. There's evidence to support that also. And then the last third, we can come to some kind of conclusion. But if God's word is true, and it is, how can we present the evidence in a positive way? You know, uh, uh, when somebody tells you, don't do that, I, uh, Reverend Wilkins should have said, hey, go ahead, stick that fork in the socket. No, no, what you say is, don't stick that fork in the socket. What do you want to do? You want to go get that fork and stick it in the socket. Don't do that. Well, our sinful reaction is almost immediate. Yeah, let's do that. Hey, that's stupid. Don't believe that. Wow, I wonder what's really interesting and exciting about that. Let's investigate that. 
So you could approach the idea of origins. You could approach the controversy between creation and evolution by saying, oh, evolution, that's stupid. That would not be a good approach. Trust me. Evolutionary scientists are far from stupid. There's much scientific evidence to be adduced in favor <coughs> of evolution. So instead, I would commend you to think about ways that we can talk about the same evidence, but more with a positive spin. Is there evidence? Yeah, you're familiar with a number of the verses that would declare this, I'm sure. Paul speaking in Romans, his attributes, God's creative attributes, have been clearly perceived since the creation in the things that have been made. So again, as a scientist, we can study those things, and we can study those things with an eye as God being the creator. You know what? People are going to tell you that the idea of creation is a ludicrous, unreasonable fantasy. Far from it. The idea of creation by an intelligent creator is very reasonable. So I want to step you through a few evidences, and hopefully um. you'll say, yeah, this is reasonable. Philippians 4 and the ESV translation, which I like of that verse, says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Sometimes translated gentleness, but I think reasonableness gets at the heart of that even better. Scientists need to be reasonable. We're trained to be logical and reasonable. So let's be reasonable as we approach this subject. When I teach cosmogony, I focus on four major origins. If you're going to investigate the origins, you have to look at four basic events. The origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of diverse life, and the origin of human beings. So what I want to do is I want to show you one positive creation evidence from each of those areas. We'll begin with the origin of the universe. Design. The fine-tuning argument goes by many different names, sometimes even as the anthropic principle. But it's basically the concept of design. You have no idea what that is. Okay? If, you're, if you're as old as I am, you know what it is. Okay? But if you're one of these students, you, what is it? This is the dial on a transistor radio. It's sort of like an iPod, okay? They're kind of <laughs> cool things, okay? If you've ever dealt with one of these, you know that in order to pick up anything reasonable, listenable, you have to turn the dial. And as you get close, you sort of hear something. There's a little bit of static. And then as you dial it in closely and carefully, you hear it better. You need to, quote, fine-tune it. The design and fine-tuning of the universe are obvious to everyone, no matter what their view of origin. Everybody accepts this. Some folks, a naturalist and materialist, needs to come up with ways, I guess as Reverend Wilkins said, sort of wave your hands to figure out where this came from. There are so many examples of fine-tuning or design in the universe that it's hard to just get them down into a few. Let's take a look at some of the objects in our solar system. The system of the sun, the earth, and the moon. You're likely familiar that the distances involved here are about right. Some scientists say if the distance of the earth to the sun and the distance of the earth to the moon were off by 10% or more, we'd have a hard time maintaining life on planet earth. Have you thought about the atmosphere that surrounds us? We hear about it a lot. One time we were concerned, and rightly so, about ozone, high up, low down. Yeah, not enough high up, too much low down. The Earth's atmosphere is a fairly amazing thing. First of all, most other planets in our solar system do not have an atmosphere. 
Venus certainly has one. Many people believe it's a greenhouse atmosphere run amok. But our atmosphere is finely tuned, unlike any other atmosphere that we have been able to investigate. It's clear, it's see-through through the visible spectrum of light, but yet it also protects us from many of the harmful rays. Uh, ultraviolet rays are filtered out for the many, most part by our atmosphere. The atmosphere on light, the atmosphere on planet Earth seems to be finely tuned for life. The atmosphere is designed to let through certain wavelengths of light that the sun produces, but to get rid of others. And by the way, have you ever heard people say, astronomers say, the sun, our star, that's sort of an ordinary, st don't believe it. Our star, the sun, is far from ordinary. It's different than most other stars out there. Reverend Wilkin mentioned, he looked through the telescope and was surprised to see those were two stars in a binary system. Most stars in our galaxy are either binary stars or the red dwarfs, very different from the sun. The sun is far from an average, ordinary star. The photosynthetic <laughs> process of plants is tuned to the sun's spectrum. Is that an accident? I would say no. You know, speaking about the atmosphere always reminds me of a story of my friend Zeb. One time Zeb went up to, uh, he went up to the top of the U.S. Bank building. You know, that's our skyscraper here in Milwaukee. And as he sat there drinking his sarsaparilla, the person next to him said, have you ever noticed the funny atmosphere way up high like this? Zeb said, what do you mean? He said, do you know that you could walk right out this window on the 24th floor and walk around and not fall? I said, I said, yeah, all right, buddy. No, really, let me show you. So the man walked up, opened up the door, just sort of walked around for a while, came back in. Zeb said, that's amazing. I got to try this. So Zeb walked to the window, took a step out, plummeted like a rock 24 stories. The bartender turns to the guy and says, Superman, you're mean when you're drunk. <laughs> The existence of the moon, is the moon just a pretty thing up there? Well, certainly God put the moon there to measure signs and seasons, etc. But did you know if we didn't have a moon, we wouldn't be here? The moon is fundamentally important for life. The distance from the earth to the moon is just right to control tidal forces. Twice a day we have high tides, right, fisher people? If it weren't for the moon, we wouldn't have, or if the moon were closer, I should say, those tides would be catastrophically strong. If the moon were further away, we wouldn't have tides. If there were no moon, there'd be no life. The tidal forces are very important to cleanse the tidal basins, to ensure that oxygen-producing organisms can actually thrive. No moon, no tides no oxygen, no life. Is it just by chance that the moon exists? By the way, the three major stellar objects recorded in scripture are the earth, the sun, and the moon. The angular size of those three things is, the, well, okay, I guess from our position, let's say, from on planet earth, the angular size of the sun and the moon are about the same. Even though the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, the moon is 400 times closer together. That means we get eclipses. Now, eclipses look pretty. Is there any purpose for an eclipse? Some people believe that there are to also measure signs and seasons. One of my colleagues, astronomer Danny, Dr. Danny Faulkner, investigated, as far as we could tell, all the moons in our solar system and try to determine would anything produce an eclipse of any kind because of the size as our moon does on planet Earth? And the answer is no. Eclipses are fairly rare, interesting, on planet Earth. Water. Water is a very unique substance. 
Unlike almost everything else we know at normal temperatures and pressure, when water goes through a phase change from liquid to solid, okay, I was a, I was a chemistry major, sorry. When water freezes, it does something weird. You know what happens? Yes, the density decreases. Yes, it expands, it floats, ice floats. We're not aware of any other substance where that happens at normal temperatures and pressure. Is that important? It is. If water did not have this characteristic, we wouldn't be here discussing it today. Because over time, everything would freeze solid. If ice were not at the surface to warm up and heat in the summertime, pretty soon lakes would freeze solid. Uh, we wouldn't have life as we know it. Interestingly, if you're a chemist, I've got to be careful, okay? I've got my physicists and chemists over here. <laughs> if you ask a, a chemistry professor, hey, why does water freeze? You'll hear hydrogen bonding. Okay, I dutifully wrote that down and put it out on the exam. What's that mean? Not sure. <laughs> Not sure. All right. Now, a couple things I want to share with you as we look at some of these evidences. First of all, what's the whole purpose of talking about creation? I look at creation as an apologetic, and I guess that's what we're talking about in this conference here. The scientific evidences that we might uncover to support creation are in no wise being used to confirm the biblical message. We don't use creation to prove the Bible. God does not need my help. Instead, we're going to use this to help answer questions. When the honest skeptic comes, when I'm sitting on an airplane and people, well, so what do you do? I'm a college professor. Oh, where do you teach? Uh, Concordia University, never heard of it. Okay. It's a Lutheran higher education community. Oh, what do you teach? Well, I teach computer science and a science course. Oh, and then it comes. You, you teach the Christian, you don't believe in creation, do you? Yeah. <laughs> well, how could you possibly? So I'll share something. I try to, I'm not going to beat them over the head with it, but I'll just share that. Are we going to be able to convince them? No. The whole purpose of an apologetic, of course, isn't to win people for Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can change people's hearts. But we are in a position to get to know people, to interact with people, and to remove some of the stumbling blocks. If materialism and naturalism is the stumbling block, if they say, gee, I can't really accept Christianity because, you know, creation, really a God that's helping me? Maybe we can help with that. Second evidence, or I'm sorry, second arena of origins, and this sheet, oh, you thought we were done, didn't you? <laughs> There's a backside to that sheet. I <laughs> fooled you. <laughs> <clears throat> the origin of life. Anybody who's seriously going to investigate where everything came from has to have an idea, a model of how life began, the origin of life. Again, I just want to focus on one evidence. And this happens to be one of my personal favorite ones. I can't help it because I am predominantly a computer scientist and I do deal with information. And that evidence is information theory. Sounds scary, and it can be, but I'm going to formulate it in a reasonable and logical way that you could share this with anybody. Imagine reading a book. It's a good book. Uh, students, don't think about a textbook because, well, first of all, nobody reads those. But secondly, they're not good. So you've read a book, and it's a good book, and you want to share it with somebody. So you run to your friend, and you say, hey, I just read this great book. It's by my favorite author, Dorothy Sayers. It's called The Mind of the Maker. And she said, and before you can get too far into it, your friend interrupts you and says, 
You ever met the author of your favorite book? No. Did you see this author, this alleged author, write this book? Uh, no. Then how do you know that the words did not randomly self-assemble in a word processor or were somehow produced by primates in an infinite number of typewriters? How do you know that? <laughs> you say, you're, you're kidding. How do I know that this book had an author? The next time somebody asks you, and I know they won't, but the answer is information theory. That's how you know. Information theory says this. Information content points to intelligence. We can formulate it this way. Intelligence is necessary to create information. I didn't see the author write the book. I've never met the author. Maybe the author isn't even alive anymore. Does that mean the book wrote itself? No. So if you have a book, even though I'm sad to say you haven't met Chuck Norris, but you know that there's an individual named Chuck Norris and he actually wrote the book. That's succinctly a formulation of information theory. How in the world could that possibly help in origins? <laughs> Some of you may know the answer to this, right? <coughs> Chuck Norris doesn't read books. He stares them down. Thanks. Some of you are really laughing, okay? We need to record this so I can play it to my class. You know, I do these in <laughs> class. <and I'm laughs> Thank you. How's, what's this have to do with origins? Well, you know the obvious answer. Every one of the 30 trillion or so cells, give or take five, in your body contains a vast storehouse of information, DNA. DNA is a very interesting thing. When I was a little boy, and I know this is the last millennium, we were taught <laughs> DNA is just basically data. It's just stuff there. DNA is both data and algorithms or instructions. In modern computer science, this is an object-oriented way of doing something where you have both data, I know you'd say information, and instructions on how to process that at the same time. The question is, where'd this come from? What's the origin of information? Now we know where the information in your cells came from. They came from your parents. But the ultimate question is the ultimate origin. Where did that first information come from? The only reasonable scientific conclusion is it came from an intelligent source. If you have information, it must have come from intelligence. Somebody asks you, well, why do you accept creation? Well, you know all that DNA that you have that's basically information content? Yeah. How did it get here in a non-intelligent manner? If they try to tell you something, just I'm, that's not very reasonable, and certainly not scientific. Some of you may know today that really over the last 15, maybe 20 years, we've uncovered a lot of interesting ideas related to the genetic code. Not only does RNA read DNA forward, and we used to think there was a lot of junk in here too, uh, probably not anymore. But actually, we read the same string both forward and backwards at times. Imagine writing a book that can be read forward and give meaning and understanding, and then be read backwards and give meaning and understanding. And I don't mean, Adam, I'm Adam, you know, it's like <laughs> a I mean, writing a book at the level of the complexity of one of your chromosomes and then having things that can read it both forward and backward at the same time. That shows to me a highly advanced level of design. The mere existence of any code, 
is scientific proof for a code maker. The mere existence of any kind of code is scientific proof of intelligence. I want you to read this and do it now. This is a secret code. Now, <laughs> you know, today you're going to use your phone and send an iMessage to your friend in class, and those are encrypted, and even if the teacher has, you know, the Wi-Fi reader, she can't figure out what's happening. But when I was in fifth grade, we couldn't do that. We had to write notes. And you wouldn't write it, you know, hi. You'd use the secret code. Have you seen this before? Yeah. See, you just... See, like the A is in that box in the upper, or, or an E has a box all around it there. Look at this R, a box with a dot in it. So now go back here. Come on. Yeah, R. Oh, I got it. Okay. Uh, a little upside down thing with a dot in it. Oh, that's a U. Got it, got it. Okay. So. What's my secret code say? Well, you can decode it and figure it out that ultimately it says run for your life. So thanks for not doing it. <laughs> the existence of a code has to have been known. This is information theory. If you have a code at all, it came from intelligence. Let's not talk about the genetic code. It came from intelligence. That's the only reasonable conclusion. This next part's a little controversial, as if creation itself isn't. I actually subscribe to the idea that there are different kinds of science. Many people refer to mathematics as a science. I can buy that for sure. When most people use the word science, they think of women and men in white lab coats, you know, using the tools of science, investigating the here and now. And that's absolutely a type of science, a great type of science. We sometimes call it empirical science. I usually use the term operation science because we're investigating the operation of the world around us as it is right now. This kind of science, as cool as it is, has one limitation. You can't investigate past phenomenon using this only. Because operation science needs to look at things that you can experiment with, observation and experimentation. So, there's another kind of science, and yeah, if you listened to a debate recently with Bill Nye, he said there's no such thing as this. Yeah, that's okay, that's fine. But I really believe that there are other kinds of science, something that I will call origin science, and I didn't make this up. Origin science uses both the tools of operation science and something else to make a model of past events. Origin science is going to, you know, this is the CSI shows, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to do genetic, and I'm going to look at DNA, etc. But at the same time, I have to use something else. I have to use some forensic tools. I have to think historically. I have to make a model of what might have been. And here's the problem. No one can be 100% certain of past unobserved events. No one can be 100% certain of past unobserved events. The folks on CSI could be, uh, they, always, they always close the case, right? And it's always true. But in the real world, there's always a little bit of doubt there. If you don't believe me, you can't even be 100% sure of past observed events. Here's my proof, instant replay in football. <laughs> we see it in high def, slow motion. Was it, was it a touchdown or not? It was a, oh, it was, oh. Right. 
no one can be 100% certain of past unobserved events. That doesn't mean we can't be warm and fuzzy. We can use this. And this is basically what I focus on in the course here. I call it cosmogony. You can also pronounce it legitimately cosmogony. I just prefer the soft G sound with that. It sounds <coughs> more intellectual, doesn't it? <laughs> and I need to share something with you. I share this with my classes usually on the first day, too. You should know something about the person standing up here. Two things. Number one, I don't know everything. And number two, I make mistakes. I'm not putting you on. Usually students ask for their money back at this point. <laughs> but I suffer from the same malady that everybody else does. I don't know everything, and I do make mistakes. Let's take a look at the origin of diverse kinds of life. If you want to explain what's happening right now on planet Earth, you have to be able to explain where did all the diversity on planet Earth come from. Did God create different separate kinds, the way the Bible indicates, or are they somehow all related through common ancestry? Let's take a look at the fossil evidence. When I talk about fossils, oftentimes people will say, well, that's strange. I thought that most folks who subscribe to creation try to ignore fossils because aren't fossils one of the great proofs of the other model? As a matter of fact, I look at fossils as one of the great evidences for the creation model. If you really understand what's going on with fossils. First of all, when you look at any fossil, now, my evolutionary colleagues will give dates to these things. And the two types of things you see here, uh, anemones, etc., they will date at hundreds of millions of years old. But interestingly, even in what some people consider to be the most, what some people consider to be the oldest, the earliest forms of life on Earth, show fantastic design and complexity. Think about the sea urchin that you saw in a fossil just before here on the left. Sea urchins, again, some people would say these are really ancient creatures. My evolutionary colleagues would say they developed about 450 million years ago and haven't changed any since that time. Sea urchins are fantastically complex. In the last 20 years or so, we've discovered some interesting things about sea urchins. Number one, <coughs> they have this protein in their body, lots of it, that's related to vision in most mammals. And what do you look at a sea? There's no eye here. So what's it doing with it? What some scientists believe right now is the sea urchin uses its entire body as an eye. It can actually see using its entire body. That would be a fairly complex design, right? Currently, scientists are investigating the um, immune system of sea urchins because although it's considered to be a very simple kind of life, it shows an extremely complex immune system. And we're hoping to use some of that to treat some diseases. Are these so-called early forms of life actually simple and unimaginable? No. They're extremely complex, very well-designed creatures. One thing the fossil record shows unambiguously is the idea of great diversity of life on planet Earth and also discontinuity. Not only are there many different kinds of life recorded in the fossil record, perhaps even more kinds that have gone extinct than are currently extant or are alive on the planet right now. But in addition, the fossil record shows that trilobites are identifiable as trilobites and theropods are identified as theropods. There is discontinuity. Biological taxonomy 
was originally formulated in its modern sense by Carl Linnaeus. You're probably familiar with that name, Carl Linnaeus. You're familiar with what I mean by taxonomy, right? Genus and species and then kingdom. Hey, when I was a little boy, there were two kingdoms. Okay, now there are either five or seven, depending on who you read. It depends how long ago that was, right? Carl Linnaeus was a Lutheran scientist. And when Linnaeus put together the taxonomy, he believed that he could actually classify organisms. Why? Because God created the system of classification. If everything were related, if everything were continuous, how, where would you draw the line? See, today we have cats and dogs. Why that line? You have cats, and then you have dats, and then you have cogs, and then you have dogs. <laughs> well, we've got this division, this discontinuity there. We see it right now, and we see it in the fossil record. By the way, what is the fossil record a record of? Here is the big point of disagreement between my evolutionary friends and myself as a creationary scientist. My evolutionary friends say the fossil record is a record of the birth of organisms over time. See, 600 million years ago in the Cambrian, whoop, here come the trilobites, and then you did, 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 you got all these creatures. Evolutionary scientists say the fossil record is a record of the birth or appearance of organisms over time. As a matter of fact, the fossil record isn't a record of birth, it's a record of death. Those things are dead. This is not a record of things appearing over time. This is a record of things dying in certain locations, in certain ecosystems, at certain times. It's actually a record of death. Although creationary scientists would not say that all the fossils were produced in a great worldwide flood, if there were such a thing as a great worldwide flood, it would absolutely produce a large number of fossils. <laughs> Speaking of fossils, reminds me of my friend Zeb and Zeke. This is sort of like the break. In their golden years, <coughs> approaching that myself, I have no idea why we call them the golden years. In their golden years, Zeb and Zeke wanted to do something, so they became greeters at Walmart. And during their break, Zeke sat down and said, oh, Zeb, I'm really feeling old today. Every muscle hurt. I did it. And Zeb says, what are you talking about, man? I feel just like a newborn baby. <laughs> Zeke says, come on, you're 73 years old. No, I mean it. How could you possibly feel like a newborn baby? Well, I don't have any hair, I don't have any teeth, and I'm pretty sure I just wet my pants. <laughs> Scientists, I need to warn you of something. Do not look for natural explanations to supernatural events. While it's exciting and interesting to speculate on how God might have created the universe, do not look for natural explanations to supernatural events. Just like Reverend Wilkin mentioned, hey, let's give away six-day creation. Okay, why? I can't, well, what about a virgin birth? Nah, no way, right? What about a resurrection from the dead? No, nah, I don't think so. Many people want to find a natural explanation to the great flood of Noah's day. People call it Noah's flood. It wasn't his, well, I guess it was his fault, but it wasn't his flood. <laughs> Don't look for a, nat you know, oh, there's some kind of water vapor canopy, and this happened, and Mars did something or the other. You know what? God said the fountains of the deep, bro you know, the sky opened up. That, that was a supernatural event. At some point in time, I'm just going to have to check and say, Yep, I, I can't explain it, and that's okay, too. What about human beings? What about us, the origin of human beings? Everybody's going to have to explain where human beings came from also. 
And although my evolutionary colleagues would not separate this as a separate origin event because a human being is just connected to every other form of life by common descent, a creationary scientist, or certainly a Christian, would. We look at human beings as being somewhat special. And that specialness will oftentimes refer to as the image of God. What is it that separates human beings from other kinds of life? And that is really the image of God. I'll give you two examples of this. First of all, the use of a symbolic grammatical language. Yeah. Do animals communicate? Absolutely they do. Do some animals have a fairly diverse language? They absolutely do. Can animals express feelings and emotions? They absolutely do. What they don't have is a symbolic grammatical language. Here we need to talk about things like the a priori and other kinds of weird things, but imagine holding a discussion with your dog about the future of the United States stock market. I can communicate with my animals. I have two dogs. They're rescue dogs. They both, when I tell them to do something, they both know exactly what I'm saying. My collie does it. My Westie says, sort of like a cat, you know, hey, that's a good one. <laughs> but thinking about abstract ideas. We're going to have a little exercise here, but I want to make sure I leave time for questions, so there's nothing under abstraction. But when you think about abstract ideas, when you want to talk about the future, when you want to reference something specific about a past, animals can't do that. Human beings created in the image of God have that capability to think about both history, origin, and ultimate destiny. Yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> Think about the creativity and the inventiveness of human beings. Anybody know what this thing is? I was hoping somebody would shout out the name because there is difference of opinion on how you pronounce the Greek word here. Okay. This is that Greek computer that was circa 80 BC. It's designed as an analog computer that was meant to compute maybe eclipses, maybe the faces of the moon, maybe certain other kinds of things. It was an astronomical computer made 2,000 years ago. Human beings are wonderfully inventive and creative. Can some animals use crude tools? They can. <coughs> Could any animal create an informational tool like this? Dealing with abstract concepts like, gee, when's the next lunar eclipse? <laughs> no. Those are unique human characteristics. So in a small way, what I've tried to demonstrate is there are a vast number of fairly straightforward evidences that can be brought forth, explained, and shared. If somebody asks you, why do you accept creation? Which really means, why do you accept the Bible? Maybe you could share one of these things with you, with them. Now, here's my hot tip. Uh, this is my wife, and this is her horse. Uh, that's not my hot tip. My hot tip is this. <laughs> if you asked my wife to, you know, if somebody asked her, why would you possibly believe in creation? She's an equine scientist. Okay, she knows horses. She would go to the hoof of the horse and tell you as much or as little as you wanted to do and explain why there is no way that that can be even imagined as an outgrowth of natural selection or common descent. The only possible explanation for the horse's hoof is intelligent design. 
Now, if you asked her about radiometric dating or polonium halos, it, huh? she doesn't know that. She doesn't have to know that. Here's my hot tip for you. If you really are interested in this and you really want to converse with the honest skeptic, find one evidence that interests you. Just one. Find one evidence. Learn it. Understand it. Share it. And when your honest skeptic friend says, well, what about this bone they found in you? I don't know. But what do you think about information theory? I'm sorry, I don't really know anything about that bone over there in Ethiopia. But, you know, information theory kind of strongly suggests to me that it doesn't matter about that bone over there in Ethiopia. You've got it. So find something that strikes you. Because people are going to ask. They absolutely are, right? I oftentimes refer this to this as the doctrine of creation. It, for me, I unapologetically derive it from the biblical text. There are other very competent apologists and scientists who don't want to do that. And I think that's fine. But for me, there's some strength in being able to connect it back to God's word, back to the biblical text. It's because what is the purpose of creation? This is it. If you're doing any apologetic, whether it's creation or anything else, and its purpose is not to point to Christ, you're doing it wrong. If your apologetic doesn't point to Christ, what's the point? Whatever you do, whatever you say, and for me, I'm sure as well as for you, this has got to be a hook back in. Hey, let me make a case that there is an intelligent designer. Oh, hey, that's not a bad case. I got better news for you. I can introduce you to the creator. What an awesome thing. Not only our responsibility, of course, according to Peter's command, but what a privilege. Let me introduce you to the creator. You know what? He's got some good news. You know that apple and that fall business? He's got it taken care of. And trust me, if Chuck thinks it's reasonable, it's got to be reasonable. I have conveniently used all but two minutes of my time. Any questions? No? Darn. Darn. Man. question is, how would you defend Jesus' virgin birth? And the answer is, I can't do that scientifically. So what I would have to do is I would have to point them to Scripture. The problem is, if you don't accept Scripture, what do you do? That's a great point. And you know what? This is beyond my realm. This is a question for somebody who knows better. Dr. Overdack, for example. Okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that, and I would freely admit, I'm sorry, I can't prove that. You know why? It was a miracle. And I can't offer any natural explanation or scientific proof for a miracle. Sorry, oh, for one, sure. But we, uh, even more than the virgin birth, we buy into the incarnation. <laughs> and if you accept the incarnation, it seems to me the virgin birth was just an element of part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, um, Dr. Dave Menton was mentioned, and Dave Menton was an anatomist for many years at Washington University. He has written and spoken widely on this subject. Um, that would be one resource. And Greg, thanks for asking the question. The very bottom here, I mean, it's impossible to list everything. I've listed three resources. Uh, Society of Creation, which is an organization of Concordia University faculty interested in this thing. Lutheran Science is just one of the organizations I belong to, and then the Creation Research Society. There are many, many great resources there. 
Uh, but there are a couple specific things dealing with, with like anatomy specifically for a doctor. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. Any specific resources are coming to mind, but in terms of day men, uh, I'm sure there's questions in the chat. The gentleman that was here last summer who did the Gen A project, the doctor might yeah. be interested. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his name. Absolutely. Name. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember either. There's a question over here that I see in here. Saying it's time to go. Folks, thank you so much. I appreciate your rapt attention.